بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله واتبع وده إلى يوم الدين وبعد أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بشيخنا والمهندس الفاضل أستاذنا أستاذ فاضل سليمان جزاكم الله خيرا ما الله سبحانه وتعالى except the sheikh decided to speak English so it's not my fault let's be very clear because we have no, a lot of speak Arabic, if everybody speaks Arabic let's speak Arabic but if one yeah, only we have both. Speak Arabic, if only one doesn't speak Arabic then we will speak English all of us Alhamdulillah so the sheikh's decision inshallah that we'll go into English we have a lot of students attendees on the on the zoom and we have a lot of them on Facebook so right now I have Bismillah MashaAllah, we, we already... Arab is the language of Ahl al-Jannah. English is the language of Ahl al-Da'wah. Bismillah. <laughs> then we're going with the English, inshallah. 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 First of all, I would like to welcome uh, our dear beloved Sheikh and, and, and Imam. He was actually an Imam here and a Sheikh in the US. Um, also an, an, an engineer. So Alhamdulillah, most of us here are engineers. So a lot of yani, a lot of us at the University of UC Davis actually are studying engineering. I'm a civil engineer myself. So the <laughs> Sheikh, alhamdulillah, is our colleague and our teacher. The first question that I would like to present, inshallah, because we have so many and limited time. But before uh, doing that, before doing that, you know that I spoke in TED twice. One of them is titled, people in this world are of two types, engineers and non-engineers. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> So this it's is our racist. first... It sounds racist a little bit. <laughs> first note. Alhamdulillah. Tayyib. Uh, inshallah, Sheikhna, we have the first question. And mm -hmm. I would like to start, inshallah, with it. Uh, why why a Bridge Foundation started as you are the founder? Why did we start Bridge Foundation? What is the need for it to the Muslims and to the non-Muslims? Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wassalamu ala Rasulullah. All praises are due to Allah, the Creator, the Cherisher, and the Sustainer of this universe. And may His peace and blessings be upon His noble Prophet Muhammad and his descendants and his companions and his followers, dear respected followers of Prophet Muhammad in Los Angeles. Jazakumullah khairan for the invite. And uh, I actually, I have been a uh, the Muslim chaplain uh, in uh, the American University in Washington, D.C. for five years, between 2000 and 2004. And I was also the national chaplain of WAMI, World Assembly of Muslim Youth. And in America, I learned da'wah uh, to non-Muslims. I'm Egyptian. And at the time of Mubarak, there was no da'wah to non-Muslims. It's something, something very sensitive in Egypt. There was a lot of friction between Muslims and Christians. So that was not allowed. So I learned da'wah to non-Muslims in America. And then I left America in the, um, at the, uh, by the end of 2004. And I went back to Egypt. And there, when I found that I can't practice again uh, what, what I've been practicing before, which is da'wah to non-Muslims because of the situation in Egypt, so I, I, was, I was really becoming like depressed because of that, because I got used to it. And then I went to Frankfurt uh, in the uh, book fair to give some lectures about uh, Islam there. And there I met uh, Dr. Murad Hoffman, may Allah shower his soul with mercy, who just died a few months ago. And uh, he was actually a very famous Islamic thinker and uh, he's a German thinker who was the ambassador of Germany to Algeria and Morocco. And then I told him my problem, that now I moved back to Egypt and I can do da'wah to non-Muslims in Egypt. And I'm, I'm, I'm used, I got addicted to da'wah. So he told me, make an international organization based in Egypt, work outside Egypt. And he's the one who got me the Bridges Foundation uh, idea. And he was uh, the first, actually, head of Board of Trustees of Bridges Foundation. And we started with him and Dr. Jamal Badawi, who is right now the head of the Board of Trustees, and Sister Yvonne Ridley. Those are the three people who started with me. And since then, we've been serving Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Alhamdulillah. Tayyib, Sheikhna, 
I heard from you once uh, a story, and I would like to share it, inshallah, on the importance of da'wah. We are here to discuss, we might have some non-Muslims too, and it's very important to present to them our ideology and why are we doing da'wah and the importance of calling people to the oneness of God with the, uh, uh, with the mixture of religion and the religious organization that we're starting. I heard from your story, and this is very important to Muslims, is it da'wah limited only to the masajid? You started something that is very beautiful on a train with, with a, uh, when you were going from Washington, I believe. So we want to hear the story, inshallah, and reflect on it okay. with the benefit, inshallah. First of all, first of all uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي قُلْ Every قُلْ in the Quran or say, it means say, O Muhammad. Since it is a say in a singular form, say, O Muhammad. Every قُلْ in the Quran. قُلْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي This is my way. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I call people to Allah. So this is the Prophet way, not our way. Okay? With sure wisdom. على بصيرة أنا, myself, that's the Prophet. وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي And everyone who follows me. So every follower of Prophet Muhammad should Learn how to call people to Allah and should call people to Allah. That's number one. Second, we are here on planet Earth as the Khalifa. I am making on Earth a Khalifa. Khalifa, to cut it short, means the boss. The boss of this Earth is the human being. You never saw a group of monkeys or bears removing a forest and building an airport or building a university. Why? Because they are not the Khalifa. We are the Khalifa. So since we work here and our job title is Khalifa, we need to know our job description. The job description, according to Imam al-Asfahani of the Khilafa, of the Khalifa of Allah, is to do four things. The first one is Al-Ibadah. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ and the second thing is at da'wah. You are doing ibadah to Allah. You have to call others to do ibadah to Allah as well. So that we can like pray in jama'ah, okay? So we have to call others. So al-ibadah, at da'wah, and the dalil on this, ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawad al hasan. The third thing is i'mar al ard, developing the earth. هو أنشأكم من الأرض واستعمركم فيها ألف سين تاء plus the verb in English in Arabic language means asking the verb استغفار asking مغفرة asking forgiveness استخراج asking obtaining and so on استعمار means asking development he created you from the earth and he is asking you to develop it so first عبادة second دعوة third developing the earth and the fourth task is uh, establishing justice the dalil of this you, you, listen don't allow anyone to play with your mind everything in islam should do with the dalil everything should be there should be always a proof the proof is in surah al-hadid allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولَنَا and surely we have sent down our messengers, all the messengers, Muhammad and Isa and Musa and Ibrahim and Nuh, and all of the messengers. Bil Bayinati with uh, with the Bayinat, which is the uh, the uh, the Everything. obvious signs, yes, which is actually the miracles. وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِزَانَ and we sent down with them the book, Quran and Injil and Torah and Zabur, all the books. Well, mizan and the balance of knowing right from wrong. Why is all that? Allah continues and says, so that people may stand forth in justice. Allah sent all the messengers and all the books to establish justice. So your fourth task is to establish justice. Number two is to do da'wah. This is answering your, um, your, your, your question. But asking about the incident that happened in, on the train, you know, it was... I came to America six months before 9-11. So I witnessed old America and new America. 
in old America, I was sending letters asking people to invite me to give them a presentation about Islam in churches, in synagogues, and so on. And actually, no one was really interested. It's like every two months, I get an invitation. And I'm sending everyday letters. I'm sending emails every day to churches and synagogues and, and universities. And then after 9-11, I was scheduling people after two months because we became fully booked. Before 9-11, I, I wanted to train myself on doing dawah. And I got an invitation to go and give and deliver a lecture uh, for half an hour somewhere in a university. It was nearly like, it was probably like my first lecture. So I didn't know what to do. I really want to, 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 to practice that with some non-Muslims. So I was on the train and the lady in front of me was reading in a book. So I looked at her and I said, would you like to take a presentation about Islam? She said, no. And she continued reading in the book. So I said, I'll give you a hundred dollars. So she looked at me. I said, if you, at the end of my presentation, tell me I did not learn anything new, I'll give you $100. She said, and how long is it? I said, half an hour. So in half an hour, you will either make $100 or you will learn something new. She closed the book and said, give me the presentation. I give her the presentation. After I finished, I took out $100 from my pocket and I asked her, are you going to take my money? She said, no, I learned a lot, so thank you. Like that, so it was just a way, I'm not really bribing people, but I really wanted to practice uh, uh, Dawah. No, 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 mute, you're mute, mute, you're muting yourself. You're still muted. What's wrong? Yes, now, I think now. Yeah. Can you talk, Sheikh? No, I could hear you now. Now, can he, no, now we can hear you. Thank you, Sheikh. The Dawah, Sheikh, now the question comes. Uh, is, it, is it tools that you learn? We know it's an obligation upon every Muslim now. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Balligu anni wa Convey on my behalf even one ayah. Mm -hmm. Is it tools only? Is it knowledge only? Or is this the mixture? And how can we develop that? Okay. Uh, By the way, I need to tell everybody something. I am, I studied Dr. Fadel and Mons Fadel yani for a few days. I've been after a few days studying. So I know when to ask the questions. And he has all of this on YouTube in full detail. So everything we got today is just a, a hint to get you on, inshallah, to follow Bridge Foundation and to continue on watching. But we are trying to open up the doors today only, inshallah. Fadel, Okay. First of all, I have an online course called How to Present Islam to Non-Muslims, which, to your surprise, is the same course I give to hundreds of salesmen when I worked in the field of marketing and sales. Because I've been in the field of marketing and sales for 17 years. I'm an electronics engineer, but I actually went to the engineering uh, uh, faculty because my dad uh, uh, wasn't very democratic. And I, my dream was to become a doctor, actually. But he forced me to go to the engineering. Uh, uh, he had his reasons. Yeah. I, I, they used to call me Jack in the Box in, 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 the, in school. So he told me, and he himself was a doctor, and he told me, to be a doctor, you need to sit for 20 hours every day and learn and study. And I'm not that kind of... Uh, of, of uh, people who can sit and study for a long time. So he forced me to go to the engineering faculty. After I finished, I wasn't really comfortable working as a technician in electronics. I worked for a year and a half, and then I studied marketing, and I shifted to marketing, and I still established a company of IT. So I worked in the field of electronics, but as a marketer. And I gave hundreds of salesmen a workshop. When I started to dedicate my life to doing dawah, <clears throat> I used the same, same PowerPoint presentation, same workshop exactly, 
and same tools of doing dawah, but I changed the application. Instead of uh, using the, the sales techniques to sell IT or to sell whatever, you use it to sell an idea. So in this course, you can learn how to spiritualize your talk and talk and inspire people, whether you are talking about a very profound uh, um, uh, concept like Tawheed or a simple concept like Qibla. Same, both of them. You can throw inspiration in the heart of people if you learn how to talk inspiringly. So that's, that's what, I, what I've been doing. And, um, and, and so it's, it's that, but of course, definitely you need to know, to, to have knowledge, but you don't have to be Sheikh Qaradawi in order to give da'wah. And when can you say, I became now knowledgeable enough to give da'wah? It will never happen. You, if at the moment you feel that you became knowledgeable enough, it's the moment when you became ignorant. No one is knowledgeable enough, but what you need is, to know and to control yourself, not to respond to a question that you don't know the answer for. There are many things that you can learn in order to start giving da'wah. And uh, that's what I, what I uh, suggest actually, that we have two courses on Bridges website. They are paid courses, unfortunately, but they're very cheap yet. So the first one is how to present Islam to non-Muslims. And this is in English. The second one, unfortunately, is in Arabic, which is, uh, how to deal with difficult questions and respond to, to misconceptions about Islam. Uh, but though we don't have it in English, but we have 30 episodes called Islamophobia season two, uh, season one, uh, which are actually refuting misconceptions about Islam. Answering to doubts, we, we live in the West and we get so many, okay? As, as you said, is it, is it our responsibility to keep answering every single doubt that is brought to us or it's better to leave it to those who specialize? And how can one train to, to be able to answer these questions? Is there a methodology that you recommend? Okay. Uh, you just need to gain knowledge and, and learn how to answer the question. L answering questions is an art beside having knowledge. So you may have the knowledge, but you may not be able to answer the question properly. Um, you need also to read the mind of the questioner and know what's lying behind or between the, the lines. So uh, I, um, I actually recommend this, this workshop for those who know Arabic. It is a very important one. It's Rad al Shubuhat. It's on website. It's the workshop that how to present Islam. Inshallah, so we, we, we are relating you to the Bridge Foundation website, and I have posted on my Facebook. Yeah and all the pages that we have on inshallah rabbil alameen i want to go into a some more depth details on uh, matters that might uh, require uh, some answers inshallah that we get during difficulties starting mm -hmm. ramadan inshallah rabbil alameen um al yaqeen having knowledge and certainty that we have inshallah the truth having certainty in our heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring goodness, having certainty about the deen. How can one strengthen that? First of all, you need to understand yourself. Um, you know, um, the mechanic has to understand the different parts of the car, the components of the car, and learn the needs of every component in order to fix it. Same thing, you need to understand yourself. Every one of us consists of four things these four things were given to us either weak and god gave us the tools to strengthen them or empty and god gave us tools to fill them up the first one is the mind 
the second is the heart, the third is the soul, and the fourth is the, the body. The, 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 uh, the mind, we were all giving empty minds. When we were born, none of us had any knowledge at all, zero knowledge. God said, he is the one who got you out from your mother's bellies with no knowledge at all. And he gave you the sight and the hearing faculty and the burning hearts so that you may be thankful, which you, you thank for the ni'mah, for the grace of Allah, by using it in a way that pleases him. So you use your mind and your sight and your burning heart in what pleases Allah, which is seeking knowledge, because he got you up from your mother womb with zero knowledge. The second thing you have is your heart, and the heart doesn't mean that uh, muscle that pumps the blood. When the word heart comes in the Quran or the Sunnah, 99% of the occurrences come as the container of the feelings. According to Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, he said, which means a non-physical thing that contains all your mashair, all your feelings. If you stop a Christian in the street and you ask him about Christianity, he will definitely start by telling you, Jesus died for me. And he will speak to you about the original sin. We as Muslims believe exactly the opposite. We believe that we were born with an original goodness, not sin. Exactly the opposite. God gave us good hearts, sound hearts, ready to submit by nature. But we have one problem in these hearts that God gave us, is that they are like mobile phones. They die every day if they are not charged. Mm -hmm. So you put your phone on the charger for about an hour every day, you need to put your heart on a charger for about an hour every day. What is the charger of the heart? The Quran. The Quran is the charger of your heart. You have to, and not only the Quran, it's Zikrullah. And Zikrullah consists of several types, is of several types. Number one is the Quran, which has to be read with tadabbur, with pondering, not just reading quickly without, without, uh, uh, without concentration. And the second is Salah, prayer, with khushu, without khushu, it doesn't count. It's not gonna charge your heart. Quran without a double is not going to charge your heart. And the third is the dua and the, and the adhkar. The third thing is your, your spirit and your soul. You need to, to clean yourself up and, and to make sure that you have a, a clean soul, you don't have ego, you don't uh, feel uh, arrogance, you don't have... So this is the... the and, and there are... I have... On everything that I spoke about now, I have a workshop that is like eight week workshop and it's free on YouTube, all of them. Uh, it's called the purification of the heart, which is a terbel iman that you know how to charge your heart with iman. And there is the purification of the soul, which is the tazkiyah workshop. And the fourth thing is your body. <coughs> if you have knowledge, because you did terbel for your mind, you may have knowledge, but if your iman is weak, then you are in trouble. Then you are a knowledgeable person who don't have iman. And if you have not, if you don't have knowledge, if you ignore giving uh, uh, growth and terbiyah for your mind by acquiring knowledge, you become ignorant. So it's not enough to focus on one and leave the other. You need to balance yourself with a strong iman and knowledge and a down-to-earth spirit, not an arrogant one. But if you have the, those three okay, 
You are a humble person, knowledgeable person, and you have a strong Iman, but you're lazy. And no one is going to benefit from that, from you. So you need to move and volunteer with organizations and to give da'wah and need to be, that's, that's what I mean by, by giving tarbiyah for your body. Giving tarbiyah for your body is not only by feeding it and going to the gym. No, it is by moving because, you know what, if you bring two cups of, of, uh, of, uh, of tea and put in one of them 10 spoons of sugar and in the other one, one spoon of sugar or two spoons only. Leave the one that has 10 spoons unstirred and the one that has two spoons, stir it properly. Which one will taste more uh, 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 sweet? The one that has two spoons. Why? Because this movement made an effect. Yes. Without movement, you don't, you don't affect. So that's what I believe, actually. Regarding yaqeen and iman, you need to charge your heart with iman. Knowledge is something else that you need to acquire it still. You need both of them to be a balanced Muslim. MashaAllah. Jazakallah khairan. And then a lot of questions from the brothers on Facebook and on WhatsApp and also on the grouping. So we'll try to... Can anyone ask about the, the new translation of the Quran? Oh, that's going to be a, a full episode tonight. Okay. We're here till Fajr, inshallah. Okay. Well, and mashallah, the, the Sheikh and the, the, our, our dear Sheikh, he is specialized also in Qur'at, the different mode of recitation. And he has a full translation, and I'm leaving that as a gift to all the people who attend today at the end, inshallah. And mashallah, he has a chain uh, in, in, in recitation of Warsh and other Qur'at. And he did a translation. So I wanted to ask right. something related to Quran, Sheikh. My, my ijazah is only in Rush. No, uh, inshallah, inshallah, soon, soon, with all the 10 Qur'at, it's easy to get now, inshallah. Inshallah. We have the Quran, the Sahaba had the Quran. And we know how to give da'wah now. We understand the concept. We're, we're trying to learn and have knowledge. But why, why don't the Quran change our life like the Quran changed their life? What's, mm -hmm. what's the problem? Because of the way we deal with the Quran. Did we add anything to the Quran? We added one thing. You know what? We made it the only book that when someone asks someone else to read it, he asks him this stupid question. Do you want me to read it with understanding or without understanding? Mm. In Arabic, when we read the Quran without understanding, let's face it. I challenge you to tell me one title of one book that is that can be read without understanding there isn't it's no. only the quran that's that's what we added to the quran we made it the only book in the world which is read without understanding mm. so we have put barriers between us and the quran without tadabbur tadabbur is not an option without tadabbur it's not gonna benefit us mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayati. A blessed book that I have down to you so that they may ponder upon its meanings. Ponder upon, upon its signs. Ayah means sign. Every, you know what? One of, the, one of the mistakes of translations is that they translate ayah into verse. Verse is bait. Verse is the unit of text in poetry. And sentence is the unit of text in prose. The Quran is neither poetry nor prose. The unit of text in the Quran is ayah, sign. Every unit of text of the Quran is a sign of Allah. So that's, that's the issue. These words of God can have a huge impact on your heart if you allow it. But we don't allow it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story. It's a funny story. People think it's a joke. It's not a joke. It's a true story that happened in my village. I'm Saeed, I'm I'm safe. The Sheikh is going to speak about Southern. If we have any Saeedi on the line. I'm Saeedi, and Saeedi. the rest of the Egyptians make fun of us because they think we are naive. <laughs> we are a bit naive. 
Allah so one of my relatives is an ENT doctor, ear and throat doctor. And he received one of the farmers in our village who is complaining of pain in the ear. He checked his ear. He found that he has inflammation inside his ear. So he gave him a course of antibiotics. He told him to take a 500 milligram capsule of antibiotic every six hours. The man came back to his uh, practice two days later and complained that the pain is not getting better at all. So the doctor said, yeah, actually antibiotic takes like four to five days to start uh, giving you a good result. So please continue taking your medication. He said, well, I can't take any more. He said, just continue, man. He said, well, I can't take any more. What's wrong with you? I'm telling you, just keep taking your medication. He said, well, I can't take any more. He said, come here, let me check you up. He's checking up. He found that he was pushing a capsule every six hours in his ear. <laughs> he didn't give an instruction. <laughs> the question here is, the man was taking the medication, but it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because he was taking the medication the wrong way. God told us that the Quran is a cure. The Quran is a medication. He said, uh, uh, Allah said, and we bestow from on high of the Quran what is a cure and a mercy to believers. So the Quran is a medication. Why isn't it? affecting us? Why isn't it working with us? Why do we still have the diseases of the hearts? Why do we still have grudges, anger, boredom, hatred? Why do we have these things? Though we uh, read the Quran every day, uh, some of us even like memorize it all. It's because of the way we read it. It does, we, we use it the wrong way. The way, you know, like that villager, that he was using the medication, but the wrong way, it didn't affect him. Same thing, that's exactly what we are doing to the Quran. If you want to benefit from the Quran, you need to ponder the Quran. What about those who don't know Arabic? Again, I have a workshop on YouTube for free called How to Ponder the Quran Even If You Don't Know Arabic. And the reason why we translated a new translation that this is a part of a bigger project called uh, Tadabbur Beyond Arabic. Pondering mm. Beyond Arabic. Even if you don't know Arabic, we translated a translation that does not only focus on, the, on translating the meanings of the word of God, rather also about translating the style of the speech of God. Allowing to have more tadabbur with, with the, of the Quran. Oh. The name of the book is the name of the book. The name of the book is the name of the book. The name of the book is the name of the book. The name of the book is the name of the book. The name of the book is the name of the book. The of the ten qira'at of the noble Qur'an. It's on Amazon, but if you find it overpriced, which I think because it's a big book, if you find it overpriced, there is a PDF uh, copy that the publisher is selling for three pounds. Okay, alhamdulillah. Very so we need, we need everybody, inshallah, on it, uh, the brother yeah. Abdurrahman. Can you have a link for it, Abdurrahman, on Amazon and send it to yes. us right now, please? Is that no, but it, on Amazon, it's not the PDF. On Amazon, it's the book itself, oh, the paperback. So if both. You it, buy it if you want it. But if no, not, if you want it overpriced, you can have the PDF from Bridges' website. I want to speak about this Quran in details, inshallah. And uh, the Shaykh promised us, uh, alhamdulillah, up all night for a few hours, five, six hours, yeah. inshallah. No. <laughs> but inshallah, we'll speak about it as a portion. But I have a question related to da'wah before we move on yeah. to something about Ramadan. When giving da'wah to different people of religion, is it important to know what their religion teaches? Like to understand people's religion, to able to talk to them? Well, well that's if you are planning to continue in da'wah with them. You need to know their background. 
But if you're just speaking to someone in the street, giving him a pamphlet or something, you don't really need to, to do that, especially that today asking about religion or in, in places where asking about religion can be considered something personal. So if it's sensitive, you don't need to do that, except if you meet for the second time and you start conversing, then here you can get more friendly and ask about it. And you, you, you need also to be like, ask permission. May I ask about your religious background? Like that, okay. Jazakallah khair. We're starting hard time now. And difficulties and people are starting Ramadan. I didn't have the concept. We want to understand the concept of difficulties and hardship. How is it a blessing? Some people might ask, and I'm going to play the bad cop here. Everybody needs to forgive me, inshallah. I don't believe that. Where is the good in every difficult that we're going through? People having hardship, seeing each other, difficulties in school, Ramadan by themselves. And Ramadan it's, itself is, is a difficulty for a lot of people now knowing how to start. The Prophet said, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٌ وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ لِأَحَدْ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ إِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ سَرَّاءَ شَكَرْ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّاءَ صَبَرْ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ In English, uh, how wonderful is the case of the believer? There is good for him in everything. And this applies only to a believer. If prosperity attends him, he expresses gratitude to Allah, and that is good for him. And if adversity befalls him, he endures patiently, and that is also better for him. So we know that we are living in a test. So the norm is that we will face problems and we will face um, uh, masaib, calamities. The dua of Prophet Muhammad was what? He was asking from Allah, yaqeen that can make him face and ease and, and uh, face with ease the masaib of a dunya, the calamity. He used to say, oh Allah, Give me strong faith that makes me bear these calamities. But he did not ask a life without calamities. Because the nature of dunya is to have calamities in it. There are three types of lives. A life that is uh, exclusively pleasure with no calamities and no hardship at all. And a life that is exclusively hardship and no pleasure in it at all. And a life that, has, is a, that is a mixture between both, hardship and pleasure. The first two types are not here in this life. They are in the hereafter. The one that is completely pleasure with no hardship at all is Jannah. The one that has completely hardship and no Pleasure at all is, 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 is Jahannam. But we are here in a mixture, so we have to face it. And you always have to find the positive things in everything and look at the good in it. You know what? Me and my wife, when we used to go to a restaurant and we find that the food is, is yucky and we're not gonna, we, we, it's, it's, it's horrible. It, we, we wasted our money. We used to laugh and say, there is something positive in this, which is we took a decision never to come to this person anymore. So we have to find something positive in everything, okay? And we need to know that the most uh, 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 rewarding deed is sabr. You know that if you give charity, a dollar is multiplied by 10, up to 700. And Allah can multiply more for wh whoever he wants. 
And there is also another deed that is multiplied, which is like making a good deed in Mecca, 100,000. Is there a deed that is multiplied more than 100,000? Yes. What is it? Sabr, patience. Allah said, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Indeed, those who practice patience are rewarded without measure, which means multiplied by infinity. Also, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Indeed, those who practice patience will be rewarding according to the best of their deeds. You know what that means? That's, that's amazing. You know, the first thing that we get, uh, we, that we are held accountable for on Judgment Day is Salah. So one of us is brought, his archives are opened, and in his record, they find that he should have prayed 24,736 prayers. If he is or she is one of the patient ones then they look for the best salah among them and they find for example that it is salat al-asr on the 14th of ramadan because he or she made wudu at home and went to the mosque and waited for the adhan and prayed with khushu and cried and it was the best salah and allah accepted this salah he is a patient person or she is a patient person, then they have to be rewarded according to the best of their deeds, which means the rest 24,735 salah will be all upgraded to be as good as this one. Next, Siam, he should have fasted 946 days in his life. For example, okay, which day was the best? that day. Why? Because of this and that. Upgrade everything to be as good as that day. So can you imagine how rewardable patience is? The question is, why is patience the most rewarding deed? Simply because it's difficult. It's so difficult to be patient. Definitely. But we need to learn how to be patient. It's, there's a way. Everything should be practiced. By the way, there is, a, there is something that you practice in order to bring khushur to your salah. Khushur is not a status that happened by coincidence. You will never be praying like that and suddenly Jibreel will descend upon you. No, no, no. He doesn't descend upon anyone. Khalas, he stopped descending 1400 years ago. Khushur is a status that you prepare. You bring it to your heart. You need to learn how to do that. Tadabbur is something that you learn how to do. Sabr, same thing. You need to learn how to be uh, patient. I'll tell you some about uh, um, a, a, an exercise that I used to do. You know, I, when I was young, I started to read Ihya Ulum uh, al It's called The Revival of Islamic Sciences. And I always used to hear people saying, Man lam yaqra al -ihya falaysa min al -ihya. The one who did not read Al Ihya is not among the living. And I hated this uh, uh, exaggeration. But when I read it, I started to say it because it's really like a revival for your heart. And in the, though it has maybe its own mistakes, it, it is a, a book written by a human being, but it's a great book. And one of the great parts of it, which is Tarweed al-Nafs, taming your soul, taming your spirit, and one of the things he spoke about, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, is how to discover your shortcomings. And he found that your shortcomings can be found uh, if you sit with, you, with yourself and think about them. And also, in the uh, words of your enemies and foes who hate you. Because, yeah, for example, if someone calls me, uh, coward. I shouldn't go fight with him. It's just maybe I'm a bit coward. No one knows. So sit and listen to your foes. Maybe they have something that can benefit you. You're a miser. Don't get angry. Maybe you're really a miser. 
Yeah, maybe, think about it. And the third way of discovering your shortcomings, you know the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Mu'min Mir'atu Akhi. The believer is like a mirror for his fellow believer. What do you see in the mirror? You don't see yourself. If you want to see yourself, take a picture on your phone and look at your beautiful selfie. But if you want, when you look in the mirror, you are looking in the mirror to, sh to see your shortcomings. And you start fixing the shortcomings that can be fixed. As soon as those that can be fixed are fixed, and those that cannot be fixed remain, you leave the mirror and you go. So the believer is a mirror for his fellow believer, which means he shows him his shortcomings. He advises him. So one of the things I discovered in myself is that I'm not very patient. I need to learn patience. So I used to take my car in the rush hour and go to the most crowded street in Cairo called Ramses Street. And any Egyptian now with us will know that that's suicidal to do that. You may not get out of this street before four hours or something. So I used to do that during the rush hour. And I go with my car like that. It's like the kamikaze. And I'm going with my car to that street. And as soon as I see like, oh, thousands of cars stopping and red lights of the, you know, the, the, the back of the cars. Oh, right. I, do like, I do like this. Yes, yes, yes. I start in giving the feeling to myself that I'm happy that I'm gonna wait. And I really wait for hours. Mm. Exercising patience until I was, I became able to control myself no, before so. I wasn't able to control. So the issue is you have to learn how to, but what are the types of patients and so on. I have, I have it. I have a, on the chat now, I will put for you a, uh, link for a, uh, an episode about patience. So you can take it, you've seen it now. That's an episode I made only like 19 minutes or 18 minutes about the four types of patients and how you can be patient. It is on one of my channels called Islamophobia TV, which is a very beneficial channel. Subscribe to it. We do not update it anymore but it has 60 episodes in Arabic and the same 60 episodes made in English. Mashallah. 30 of them are refuting atheistic misconceptions and the other 30 are refuting general misconceptions about Islam. MashaAllah. Can we have the post? And we have two questions uh, related, inshallah. Mungkin il post Allah like a doctor? I posted it. Does, does your organization provide materials and flyers to distribute to non-Muslims? No. We, uh, we, we, listen, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what we do. We made three documentaries about Islam. Suhaib Webb is in two of them, by the way. And he's a great uh, 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 friend of mine. Uh, these doc documentaries, some of them are in 31 languages, including Hebrew. Mm. And they are very effective. One of them is called Islam in Brief. It explains the six sections of faith, the six beliefs of Muslims, and the five main deeds, which are the five pillars. The second one is about jihad. It's called jihad on terrorism, explaining that jihad is not terrorism. Actually, jihad is the war on terrorism, the real war on terrorism. And the third one is about women. It's called Islam in women, not women in Islam. That's not a mistake. It's called Islam in Women, and it was filmed in 12 uh, countries. All of these are on different channels. So if you subscribe to Bridges Foundation channel, you will find a menu called channels, which means the sister channels. So the sister channels are Bridges Foundation channel, Islamophobia channel, Islam in Brief channel, Jihad on Terrorism channel, and Islam in Women channel. MashaAllah. And we have the YouTube link on the chat, alhamdulillah, for any brother. And we're going to post it, inshallah. Uh, Abdurrahman, can you have a copy of that on the Facebook? Jazakallah khairan. We have two questions before we move on. Uh, you, started, you started a very... Uh, let's keep that to the end because my daughter, Ali, Fatima, she want to ask you something. Uh, uh, 
you started a program for boys only. It's not the true. soccer the soccer game. No. No, 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 no. Who said that? The Fatema. Ali Fatema. Fatema. Come here. Fatema. Come here. I want to tell you something. You know that my no. daughter is called Fatema? Mashallah. Oh, what? The Sheikh has a program. Um, it's, can we explain a little bit about the program? It's okay. okay, okay, okay. I'll explain an explanation for Fatima first. No. This program is just a game, Ya Fatima. Mm -hmm. you, a game you play on computer. Mm -hmm. You shoot penalties to the computer. You're not really uh, wearing shorts outside in a soccer field. You just play on computer. He doesn't so like soccer. Computer. Wallahi, the best players who played that game are girls. The second, the second game that we are working on right now is called Save the Turtles. So yeah. you, Fatima, will be on a boat recycling plastic bags and plastic straws that are killing turtles in the ocean. Not in the ocean, in the Mediterranean Sea. And you are gaining points and as soon as the f you run out of fuel, you go into one of the uh, ports, uh, cities around in the Mediterranean to fuel up, to refuel your boat. And there you watch a beautiful video, two kids speaking to each other. And then you answer questions. And if you answer right from the first time, you get double score. And then you continue to save more turtles. And then you find it's 15 videos with very nice questions, very challenging questions in this one. We are going to launch this game, uh, inshallah, by the beginning of Ramadan. But right now we have after the match, which is penalties that you play against the computer. You're not really in the field. And by the way, the, the best scorers are girls. But what's the what's the what was the goal behind it? What 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 is it doing for parents? We have so many parents. That's, yeah, but this answer is not for Fatima. Okay, right. this is something else. Hello, she's gone. No, yeah. no. Of course. Well, we have a program that hmm. protects from atheism, and this program uh, actually is consists of games to children where we are embedding in their minds and hearts certain uh, uh, concepts and values that make the, uh, the, the root causes of atheism not work whenever she faces any of these root causes. And all of us are subjected to such causes of atheism. Mm. So if we have these principles and these values in our hearts, they're not gonna work with us. So we are doing that for children through games and for parents and teachers, we have another workshop, which is with it, that you watch and you learn every single video, what exactly is it dealing with? And how is it dealing with? It? And if there is something we need from you and her mother to do with it so that we can strengthen this value in her heart. Inshallah. Can all parents please, uh, I, I recommend we already got the program, Alhamdulillah, we started it and I need to, as a recommendation for the, we have the MC, MCA Dawa live here with us. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Fadl, if you came to California, we are closer to the Santa Clara area and they are one of the biggest organization in the area. We are in Davis and Sacramento and mashallah, they are here with us too. I recommend for their parents and to send out inshallah for Masjid al Noor is also one of the biggest attendees in Sacramento. We have five schools all over the world playing, children playing against each other. It, Save the Turtles will be an international uh, 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 contest. And every month, the scorer of the month will receive a t-shirt from Bridges or a mug from Bridges. So there will be a scorer of the month every month. And the children of five schools until now are playing against each other. And the schools are actually, we are adding to the schools, alhamdulillah. Many schools are adopting our program in their curriculum now. It's an amazing program that was made very professionally through child psychiatrists and educators and myself. We have put together these values
that should be put. Let me give you an example. For example, one of the root causes of, uh, of atheism is that people, you know, people think, you know, propagandists do pro negative propaganda about Islam. They say that Islam is oppressive for women and for LGBT people. How, you know what, this root cause is dealt with in the first game which Fatima is playing mm. without talking to kids about sexuality at all, without talking to kids about, um, uh, 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 about, about women rights or anything at all. How did we deal with this? We have embedded in her heart that the word Islam oppresses is an oxymoron. Islam does not oppress. Mm. A part of this war, uh, game mainly is about the importance of removing oppression and that her, one of her uh, tasks on earth as the Khalifa of Allah is to remove oppression and help the oppressed. So when she is playing that game all the time, answering this question all the time to move on and play the rest of the game, this is embedded in her heart and mind if she meets an Islamophobe 10 years from now in university who tells her Islam oppresses women or oppresses LGBT, she's not going to listen. No, sure. Different from someone who grew up ignorant about Islam. No. So like that, we, we, it, is, it is made very professionally. MashaAllah. We are going to have all these, inshallah, all the resources are going to be on, on our page and the doctor's page and on Bridge Foundation. You could find it. Please subscribe to it. Get it for your children. Benefit from it, inshallah. I have a, I have a question. Uh, yeah, but, but if they want to subscribe, they need to know how to subscribe because we have a coupon that gives them, the, because they need to buy after the match which is the, the games, and they need to buy a, a workshop called uh, uh, Protection from Atheism for Parents and Teachers. And if they put the coupon, it gives them, they pay only one, understand me? Yes. So they need to know how to do that. Unfortunately, these things are a bit, you know, I don't know why they are making these things complicated in our website. Um, let me get you the... Uh, the clock. What's that? Uh, I have a good news. I wanted to ask about optimism, but I have good news on optimism. We have a okay. sister. She's saying, um, she's watching now. She said, uh, how do I become a Muslim? Every time I watch you guys talk about prayers, I admire you. And I'm wondering how one could become a Muslim. Thank you. May God bless. Money is a... Hmm. Alhamdulillah. It, it opens up the, the next question. To, to our dear guest. Are you, are, are you optimistic, uh, Sheikhna? <sighs> first, I'll, I'll answer this, but I am now pasting here. I just mm -hmm. said now how to subscribe and the coupon is called Ramadan-2019. Okay? okay. I hope everybody got it, inshallah. We have it yeah, all. I said to all panelists. No. Alhamdulillah. All panelists. Yeah. No, I will and, send it to all, inshallah. Okay. It's sun. Am I optimistic? No. Do we have an option? The Quran says, No one despairs of the mercy of Allah except disbelievers. I will tell you, I'm, I'm coming, I'm telling you. A believer is obligated to be optimistic, no matter what happens. I'll tell you something. What is the uh, biggest calamity that can happen to uh, a human being? Isn't it like losing a child? Losing a child is a huge, is a big calamity. Yes. A big calamity. Yes. So what if someone loses a child? God forbid. What does he do? He has to look at someone who had bigger calamities and he was patient to know that his calamities are not the biggest so maybe someone who lost two children 
is ha had a bigger penalty. So what if someone lost two children? He has to think about someone who lost three children. And those who lost three children, we think about someone who lost four children. Someone lost four children, yes, al khamsa She was um, uh, one of the um, uh, uh, female companions, I think. And uh, there is someone who lost five children. There. Do you know someone who lost six children? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's a problem. Every time you ask Muslims, how many children did the Prophet, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lose? They say, one, Ibrahim. He died and he buried him and he cried. Really? Seriously? We all know that he had seven children, four girls and three boys. And when he died, there was only one left. Which means he lost six children. Three of them are women who got married, brides, and they even be, had children. They left him grandchildren, orphans. Why most Muslims do not realize that, that the Prophet lost six children? What deceived them? It is the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. It is not the seerah of a depressed man. It's a seerah of an optimistic. A, an outgoing man, a productive man, a very successful man. He was so successful and optimistic during the time when he was losing six children. Anyone else could have thrown himself off the balcony. Very depressive. It's not depressive for the prophet. Why? Because he understood that he is here to be tested and his patience to be tested and he passed the test. This is an issue. The second thing about Al-Qadr, you know, Allah is not going to reveal to us the wisdom behind everything he does. So where is the test then? The test is to put your trust in Allah. Listen, uh, Allah says in the Quran, فَلَمَّا تَرَى الْجَمْعَانِ قَالَ أَصْحَابُ مُوسَىٰ إِنَّا لِمُدْرَكُونَ And when the two groups cited each other, Musa and the believers with him and Fir'aun with his army and from the other side there is the sea. The followers of Moses said we are indeed overtaken. We are caught. قَالَ أَصْحَابُ مُوسَىٰ إِنَّا لَمُدْرَكُونَ قَالَ كَلَّا إِنَّ مَعِي رَبِّ سَيَهْدِينَ Before any wahi comes to him, before any revelation comes to him, he has put his trust in Allah and said by no means. My Lord is indeed with me. He will guide me. Sayahdeen. Qalla inna ma'i rabbi sayahdeen. Fa'awhayna ila Musa. After that, we revealed to Musa, strike the sea with your staff. Whereupon it split. So he had, he had, he had his, his, uh, he has put his confidence of, uh, in Allah. And how do we do that? I'll tell you something. I don't know if you know that or not, but I'm a survivor of 9-11 myself. No. Every year, hmm. on the 10th, 11th, and 12th of September, I used to attend a conference in the United Nations. I put myself, my name, on the United UN.org, you will find that I gave a workshop on the 11th of September, 2002. In 2001, I was still there. I also went there. And I had two other friends coming from overseas to attend the conference with me. And the first thing on the 11th of September that we wanted to attend was a talk by a professor called, I think, Mahal Gindi from Southern California University. I believe that. She was called something Al-Gindi. I think she's from Egyptian descent. And it was at 11 in the morning. So we didn't want to attend anything before that on that day. And we finished our breakfast in our hotel, Crown Plaza, in Broadway area in New York, around 8 o'clock in the morning. So we had a window of three hours of free time. And those brothers are coming from overseas that are tourists that want to see around in New York. So they said, we have a window of three hours. 
why don't we go to the World Trade Center, buy the ticket and go to the panoramic floor, take some pictures, and then we can take a taxi and go to the World Trade, uh, to, the, to the United Nations. So at eight o'clock in the morning, I was in the Broadway area in Manhattan, stopping a taxi, going to the World Trade Center. Mm. When you are there to, yeah, when you are there to stop a taxi, if you're lucky, the taxi stops quickly in the first minute, and you will be happy. Yellow cab. No cab. Yeah, no cab stopped for us for half an hour. From eight to eight thirty, stopping a cab, and no one is stopping for us. So we were so disappointed. It was very disappointing. Had a taxi stop for us. When in the, in the beginning, it takes like 25 to 30 minutes to go by taxi to the World Trade Center. We could have reached the World Trade Center at 8.30, bought the ticket, took the elevator upstairs, and 8.40 was the first hit. So God was saving our lives when we were disappointed in the street hating what's happening, hating that we are there trying to stop a taxi for half an hour. Since that day, I am never happy and I am never sad. Since that day, I accept. So how many times, ask yourself, how many times were you excited about something and then you discover later, later that, oh, it's the worst thing that happened to me in my life. And how many times the opposite, you get upset because something, a certain thing happened, and then you discover that, wow, that was the best thing in my life. So if we do not really know what's really good and what's really bad, why are we still exaggerating our feelings of happiness or our feelings of sadness? Al-Iman bil wal qadr believing in the divine destiny, in the destiny and decree, is to exchange those two feelings of happiness and sadness with the feeling of acceptance with a feeling of contentment. So if we understand these, Islam is so philosophical, but simple at the same time. If we understand such concepts, we can uh, skip a lot of depression in our life, a lot of stress in our life, if we just understand these things. Okay. And you what? How do we raise our kids in order to boost? Okay, I'll leave that to the end because I want I want the Sheikh to give the Sheikh time to speak again for the brothers who just came in on Facebook. Now we have more people following on the uh, the, the family part and the plan for Ramadan. So we could move out of all this depression and hardship that we're going through. Yeah. <coughs> it's already 3 o'clock by the way it's already 3 a.m. Uh, where Sheikh is in London so it's uh, it's 3 a.m. Yeah. Uh, yeah stay with us awake they're they're awake alhamdulillah and I'm awake so, I was no, them them the, uh, the attendees ah they're, they're not awake now they're 7 o'clock 7 p.m. smell the coffee Allahu Akbar anyway uh, what were you saying because I forgot El, uh, uh, preparation for Ramadan and, okay. and goals. Okay. First of all, you need to know because we get deceived sometimes by the concept that there is no Satan's in Ramadan and therefore we're okay, we're safe. But that's not true. There is a hadith, definitely, that says, um, uh, yeah, yeah, whenever Ramadan starts, <coughs> the gates of Jannah are wide open, and the gates of Hellfire are wide open, and the shayateen, the Satans, are put in chains. But to understand any topic, you cannot judge the topic from one statement ever. You have to gather all what came about that topic in the Quran and the Sunnah. What are the shayateen? What are hmm. the sins? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, 
وكذلك جعلنا لكل نبي عدوا شياطين الإنس والجن يوحي بعضهم إلى بعض زخرف القول غرورة and thus we made for every prophet an enemy satans from among humans and satans from among jinn unseen beings revealing to one another fancy words in order to deceive which means that there are human shayateen and jinn shayateen which type of them is put in chains the prophet sallallahu said a second hadith atakum shahr ramadan shahr mubarak farad allah alaykum siyamahu تفتح فيه أبواب الجنة وتغلق فيه أبواب الجحيم وتغل فيه مردة الشياطين. which means the month of Ramadan has started. it is a blessed month which Allah has obligated on you fasting its days. and in it the gates of Jannah are wide open and the gates of hellfire are wide uh, uh, closed are closed. And the giants of devils are put in chains. So it's the giants of the devils. There is a third hadith that says, إِذَا كَانَ أَوَلُ لَيْلَةٍ مِنْ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ صُفِّدَتِ الشَّيَاطِينُ وَمَرَدَتُ الْجِنِّ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ At the first night of Ramadan, the giant jinn of the devils are put in chains, which means, that those that are put in chains are the giant jinn devils. What about the ins devils? What about the human devils? They are unleashed. They are actually getting ready for Ramadan. They got ready already. Yeah. They have filmed lots of films, lots of episodes, lots of video clips and songs and things to steal Ramadan from you. So the first thing you need to do is to have the intention that you are not going to waste Ramadan in watching films. That's the first intention from now on. Put your TV set in a box and pray Janazah to it. Allah, for it. Allah, for <laughs> takbirs without ruku and sujood. It died. Don't open it. <laughs> Second, what about Ramadan at the time of Corona? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فلولا إذ جاءهم بأسنا تضرعوا ولكن قصد قلوبهم وزين لهم الشيطان ما كانوا يعملون. so Allah سبحانه وتعالى said had they had they beg Allah from all their hearts when our calamity befalls them, which means that when calamity befalls us like coronavirus, it's time to beg Allah. It's not too late. It doesn't mean that the, that the hereafter started. No. So it's time to start that, to start the begging Allah and so on. So we need to put a program. Every day we have CM, definitely. What else? We have to recite the Quran with Tadabur. How to do that with Tadabur? If you know Arabi, watch a, a playlist on Bridges uh, channel called Mafatih Al Tadabur. And I hope you put for them the uh, the 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 link. No. 14, 14 short videos. Some of them are eight minutes only. That will teach you the techniques of tadabbur, how to do tadabbur for the Quran. If you do tadabbur for the Quran every day, it will change your life. The Quran will turn into a living being inside your heart. If you don't know Arabi, we have another playlist called, a workshop called, How to Ponder the Quran Even If You Don't Know Arabic. Still, it's a playlist on Bridges Foundation channel. It's a four hours workshop. It's a, it was a one day workshop. It's for free on YouTube. Watch it. And I suggest that you start doing tadabbur from Bridges translation. Get the PDF and start it because this one allows you to do more tadabbur than the uh, regular translation, which are good translations. But this one is different. This one was made to serve 
the 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 tadabbur uh, uh, goal. What's special? And, yeah. What's more special about the translation? <laughs> there is a lot of translation. I was waiting for that question. <laughs> there is a lot of translation out there. What made it special with the ten? I know it, it has translation of the ten qiraat too, but a lot of people might say the same question. We don't know qiraat, so does it add you something to? No. You don't need to. You don't need to know the qiraat. There are three main new features in this translation that do not exist in the other translations. The first one, which is the reason why I decided to do this translation years ago, is that I wanted to do a translation for the Quran that embraces the grammatical shift phenomenon. It's a Quranic phenomenon. Those of you who don't know Arabic will be shocked now. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> when you learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the hereafter in the Quran about 500 times 99.5% of them in past tense not one translation cherished this all of them changed it into future tense <coughs> in Surah Al-Zumar <coughs> Allah said, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ زُمَرًا I will let your Imam, Sheikh Ammar, tell you what it literally means. In English, please. وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ زُمَرًا But don't read it from a translation. Sikha, uh, that they were dragged to hellfire. hellfire. The people of hellfire were dragged. Yes. Dragged in Sikha. past tense. Yes. The evildoers were thrown in hellfire in past tense. 165 translations turned it into future tense. You will never see that. In the translation, it says, they shall be dragged. Mm. And I met great translators in my life, some of the best translators. And I always ask them, who gave you the right to change the tenses of the verbs like that? And they always told me, what do you mean? I said, when Allah speaks about the hereafter, he speaks in past tense, mm. always. I said, but the English reader will find it awkward. I don't, it's not my business. It is the right of people, Muslims and non-Muslims, to learn how their Lord spoke. Your Lord did not speak like that. He spoke in past tense nearly every single time. He spoke about that future event. That's amazing. This is something that should be pondered. Yeah. So that's first. So we embrace the grammatical shifts. So this book is not about translating the meanings only. It's about translating the style of speech of God. The other feature. Allah said, Muhammad in the Quran four times. The word Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, four times. But in other translations, it's like 500 times. Why? Because anta is you in English. Antum is also you in English. Yes. The pronoun in plural form or in singular form is only you in English. So, so, so that uh, because and because of that, the translator wanted you as a reader to know that this you is in singular form. He has put two brackets after it. You, O Muhammad, to tell you it's a singular you. Mm. You, between brackets, O believers, to tell you that it is a plural you. But like that, he is pushing his own understanding on you as a reader. Who said that Allah wants to say you, O believers? Maybe it's all mankind. And, and also the impact of every time you read the, the, uh, uh, an ayah with a singular you, you, you read you, O Muhammad, it's, it's doing a different effect on your heart. For example, Jews and Christians will not be pleased with you, O Muhammad, until you follow their religion. It's different from Jews and Christians will not be pleased with you until you follow their religion. Different impact on your heart. 
it's not exclusively for the Prophet. Mm. And Allah doesn't say, O oh, Muhammad, in the Quran. Why add another 500 times to the four times only? So that's the issue. What did we do here? We did something new to the English language. We added a superscript, SG, next to the pronoun. Let me, let me get you an example now. Uh, I will find you an example and I will do share screen to show you that, okay. Bismillah, I'm opening now a Word document. Okay, this is Surat Ashura. Let me now do share screen. Okay. What happened? No, not this. Share, okay. Stop share. I want to change the screen. I said one moment, one moment with me. Um, this, share. Okay, alhamdulillah, look here. It says, كَذَلِكَ يُوحِي إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ Here, Hamim, Ayn, Sin, Qaf, thus reveals to you, and you see this SG? It means إِلَيْكَ it means mm. that this U is singular. MashaAllah. Okay? And there is also PL, which is plural. I want to find you. Ah, here. Here. In ayah number 10, mm. it says, وَمَخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِيهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And whatever, ma whatever matter, U, PL. PL means plural. Uh. I don't need to say all people. I don't need to say all believers. I don't need to say all my kind. Just I am telling the reader this is plural. This is singular. Same thing in the uh, in the imperative form of verbs. Say. قل. But there is قولوا آمنا بالله. It's also say. A convert who converted to Islam 23 years ago read my translation and she broke down and cried. I said, why did you cry? She said, I read a verse that I love so much and I've been reading for 23 years and I discovered that I, was, I, I had the wrong understanding. I didn't know that it's talking to me. I thought it's talking to the Prophet also, only. Mm -hmm. Understand? So this brings you closer to the spirit of the Arabic text itself. We did not focus on only translating the meaning. We focused on putting you in front of, and it is the closest to the Arabic text. The third feature is that it is a, um, it embraces the four, uh, the, the ten qiraat of the Quran, and this is in the footnotes. Whenever you see a red, a word in red, it means that there is a variation in qiraat. You go to the footnotes and it tells you Ibn Amr and Hamza read it as like that. That's it. Allah khair, May Allah bless you. Amrak, ya Rabbi. Mm -hmm. I have two questions, inshallah, and I hope, I hope you have it, inshallah. And, and I want a public promise, inshallah, to have you more on with us. Inshallah, but, send me this video to post it on my YouTube, inshallah. It says, Sheikh, I am. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to tell you that I'm going to tell you that I'm <تصفيق> المدرسة مثلا عايزة المدرسة كلها تكون مسلمين حتى يدخلوا الجنة فهل نجرئهم على على الدعوة في سن صغير وأيضا I'll tell you it differs from one place to another if you are in the bible belt and this is gonna put the kids in trouble and stuff like that I'll tell you don't do that so let's not put maybe our children I'll tell you something we can teach them دعوة we can let them start doing it uh, from time to time. But to go, you know what, if, if you know how to swim, this doesn't mean that you throw yourself or your kid in the ocean. So don't put your kids maybe too early for them to face calamities for the sake of Allah and Islam. They may not be able to bear this. And we don't want any negative feeling to come to the child because of Islam. I don't want that. 
Mm. That's why I always tell people, for example, if you believe that birthdays are haram, you don't want to make birthday parties for your kids, don't tell them haram, please. Just tell them, I'm not going to make birthday parties. Give them any reason, but I'm not going to make birthday parties. But if you say haram, kids, children do not understand haram. They will only understand that because of Islam, I'm not enjoying like the rest of the kids in my class. You understand me? So kids should have a very positive, pleasing experience with the Quran, with Islam, and so on. So stop telling kids, this is haram, this is haram. They, they may not understand that about things that they want. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, how do we raise our kids in order to boost their confidence as Muslims living in a non-Muslim community? Oh, okay, that's, that's very good. I have 10 episodes this year in Dhikra wa Ibra about that, about the, the Muslim identity. <sighs> There's a lot of things. Uh, first of all, they need to understand that we are different. And it's, there's nothing wrong with being different. Yani in, in one hand, which two fingers are similar? None. So if in one hand, there isn't two fingers that are similar, why do you expect that we will be similar? We're not similar to each other. So we are different from them. They have their religion, we have ours. They have their way of life, and we have ours. So they have to accept that. And this should be clear. And we are going to accept them as they are. They have to accept us as we are. And we're going to treat them in the same way they treat us, or even better. But they have to understand, we have, we have always to focus on the things that, for kids, it may seem to be like drop falls or, or shortcomings or stuff like that. For example, uh, the Muslim world, we all know that it's, it's, not, it's underdeveloped. So why don't we show kids that the pioneers in every branch of science were the Muslim scientists. And when kids ask, why didn't this continue? We say that because Muslims stopped being righteous and stayed away from the right understanding of the Quran, so their status deteriorated even in sciences. And they have to understand that when the Quran descended, it descended on the Arabs, who are very humble people, very poor people. Maybe the biggest ambition of the Arab was to um, have as many goats as possible, as many dates as possible. Within 40 years from the descendants of the Quran, they were the pioneers in every branch of science. What happened? What changed them? The Quran. How? The first word was Iqra. Read. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra again, read again. Wa rabbuka al-akram alladhi allama, taught, bil qalam, pen. Maybe there were cities that didn't even have pen at that time. So when the first two lines come, ordering them to read twice, and speaking about pens, and speaking about learning, and then all through the Quran, he's praising those who have knowledge, praising those who think, praising those who look around them. This change, it was in a, a paradigm shift. Our kids need to know that. So we need to, anyway, there are 10 long episodes about that. How to teach them how to pray, how to make them stick to their prayers and stuff like that. Hey, we'll have it, inshallah, poster also. Um, I know I, I promised the Sheikh an hour and a half and I, I don't want to keep him long because it's late. But this question, it is very related and inshallah, I, I really want to ask it because the Sheikh in, in, in Washington, I heard from him that he was saying before September 11, they used to have one, two or, or more a week Muslims, new Muslims coming in. And after that, they used to have four Shahada and more in one day. So the brother is asking, we, with all the resources we have, it's easy to give people Yani to give people Dawah and Shahada to take in people who, uh, who wants to give Shahada, but it's much more difficult to keep them engaged and yeah. to keep up with them. Yeah. You face something like that, your experience, yeah. inshallah. Yes, yes, of course, that's because we always focus on bringing people to Islam. Mm. So we have a lot of programs on Dawah to non-Muslims. What about 
are bringing Muslims, what about breeding Muslims? So that's that's a that's a shortcoming, and that's why we focused on an, another program, which, which is Tarbiya program. It starts with Mafatih Tadabur, how to ponder the Quran even if you don't know Arabic for English readers, and the Mafatih Tadabur for those who know Arabic. So first thing we taught, we teach new Muslims how to read the Quran and ponder the Quran and in, enjoy the Quran. And then comes the second workshop, which is the purification of the heart. It's also a playlist. And in this workshop, we have daily homework that we see that they are doing their homework, reading the Quran every day for about 60 minutes and stuff like that. After this workshop, there is a tazkiya workshop, which is a tarbiya ruhiya or the purification of the soul. So those, this is like a 25-week program. It's a very strong program, but it, it, it changed the lives of so many people, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So we have it now, Yatadabbaru, how to ponder upon the Quran. Yatadabbaru? No. We have purification of the heart. Yes. And then the third one? The purification of the soul. Purification of the soul. This is a program for new Muslims. Especially new Muslims. For all Muslims. It's no. for all Muslims, new and old. Inshallah, I mean, there is, uh, if there is not enough time. Type. We have a lot of other questions, inshallah. We could have more meeting with the Sheikh. Somebody's asking, what should we expect fi sawa'ad al this season? Bas yani, something at the end, mashallah. It's a... Okay, I'll tell you something. This, this year I have two shows in Ramadan. Dhikra wa Ibra, the season four which is extremely important this time there are 10 episodes on uh, only about the muslim identity hmm. and several other topics and the second thing is in which i appear with 15 other great actually they are great scholars and great dua i'm not but i appeared with them i don't know why they invited me but i appeared with them so the issue is uh, it's very interesting. This year, the topic is about Ummahat al Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers. And I made an episode in Dikra wa Ibra about that because when I was invited and I was told the theme is the mothers of the believers, I said, Come on, let's talk about atheism, combating atheism, about this thing. They said, It's it's fixed and everyone was told that this is the theme start preparing something okay and then i found that in 25 years giving dawah now i did not make one talk about the mothers of the believers and i felt so bad i felt that like i am not a good child they are my, my mothers and then I said, okay, let me prepare something to say. When I go to Turkey next week, what can I do? What am I going to prepare? Okay. What am I going to say with Omar Abdul Kafi and uh, Ratib al Nabulsi and Abu al Mukhri al Idrisi and like amazing speakers? Hmm. I'm not going to sound good at all. So, what am I going to say next to these people? So I said, okay, I am someone who's doing da'wah in bridges. I will just tell people what these women these mothers of the believers how they supported me in my da'wah and all i did is i ran their names on my computer that's it and i found that they were always with me in everything i did in the qiraat they exist Lydia Aisha narrated a hadith that she heard prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam Recited, reciting Farawhun Warehan, Farouhun Warehan. So she exists in the Qur'an, she supports. And in the protection from atheism, they support. I have issued things, and you will see that in Sa'ad al In the Da'wah to non-Muslims, they support it. In everything I did in my Da'wah, they were always there, like a mother watching her child during studying, from a distance. Just if he, see, if he needs anything, she makes him a sandwich, she brings him something to drink. They were always with me. And I was heedless of this. 
I really felt so bad because of that. May Allah forgive me for that. Amen, Ya Rabbi. Jazakumullah khayran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and, and, and give you more strength, inshallah, and energy for the da'wah. And I am, I am more than honored, wallahi, and blessed okay. to have you and, and, and accept honor. the invitation. And, and, you know, I know a lot of people are, and they're, everybody's asking, when can we have uh, our, our dear Sheikh Fadl Sulaiman again? And I told them, you, you want to see him, you see him with me, inshallah. That's you can't Allah. even see, you can't even meet Sheikh Ammar himself now. Allah You can't Allah. meet each other now. Inshallah. So inshallah, when this is over, peacefully, inshallah, I'll come and I visit you, inshallah. Bismillah. We, you have an open invitation from six masajid so far. We have it. We have it prepared, and everybody's sending. And I told them just wait till Corona is over, and then we start. Inshallah, <laughs> and we will have for sure. Inshallah, more meetings with uh, our dear <laughs> beloved guests. Inshallah, to discuss uh, some more uh, detailed misconceptions about Islam that a lot of students want to hear, such as women's right in Islam, how to deal with atheism, how to deal with non-Muslim. That will be discussed, inshallah. I want it to be an open intro today uh, to our dear esteemed guests, inshallah, and to honor his presence. So forgive me if we didn't answer most of the question, but alhamdulillah, this should be a starting to open up the door to more discussion, inshallah. Ustazna wa shaykhna al-Bashman's father, jazakallah khayran, rafa'allah qadrak fi dunya wa al-akhir. We are the video. We, we are doing recording. We should send it inshallah very shortly. And I will keep you on updated inshallah for the next sessions. Jazakumullah khayran. Allah nitqabbal minna wa minkum Ramadan. Wa an yani yaftah lana wa lakum abwaab al-khayr. Sa'idna bi liqa'ik wa tasharraf. Fatima tsalim alayk wa layla al-saghira wa kulli al-bayt inshallah. Jazakumullah kulli khayr wa rabbina ikgura khayr inshallah. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Salam alaykum shaykh. Amen. Barakallah fi fatha Allah.